I, I have thought that the historic function of habeas is to, one of its functions is, is, is to test uh, the, the jurisdiction and the legitimacy of a court. Well, but sh habeas corpus generally doesn't give a right to a pre-enforcement challenge, and this court, for example, in Schlesinger against Cal To a forum that is prima facie uh, properly constituted. I mean, it, this, this is not a, you know, a, a, a necktie party uh, where, 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 where it parades as a court and it's been constituted as a court. We normally wait until the proceeding's completed. Well, that's exactly right, Justice Scalia, and Congress has spoken to this precise issue in the DTA. Whatever was the question about applying judgment. If you assume that uh, uh, the laws of war apply, and perhaps the treaty applies, isn't the issue whether this is a group of people on the one hand or a regularly constituted court on the other? Well, I mean, I, I don't really think there's any serious dispute about which it is. I mean, this is something that is... Well, they argue very strenuously that this is really just a group of people. Well, it, and if this because court... Because it's not a regularly constituted court within the meaning of the treaty. Well, Justice Stevens, I think that even if a court might have had jurisdiction to hear just that issue and nothing else before the DTA, Congress has now spoken. And Congress has made it clear that whatever else is true, these military commission proceedings can proceed and exclusive review can be done after the fact, after a conviction in the D.C. Circuit. Exclusive review of what? I don't see that the, that the, that the, uh, the DTA preserves a right to review of the very issue that they want to raise here. Well, I think I disagree. They, they, at least they, can, they, can, they can review their, their enemy combatant determination. They can review the consistency of the procedure of the court uh, with whatever law applies. But I don't see that there is a clear reservation of right to get to the very basic question of, of, the, of the constitution of the court itself. Oh, I disagree, Justice Souter. E3 specifically preserves the claim that the commissions were not and the procedures were not consistent with the Constitution and laws of the United so States. So you're reading procedures to, to, to encompass uh, the very act constituting the court itself? Is that the government's, I mean... Sure, if they want to come in and argue that there is a violation of, of, of Article 21 of the UCMJ or Article 36 of the UCMJ after their conviction, they are perfectly free to do that. It's under hard for me to see that with the language of this because the language that you're talking about refers to such standards. Such standards and procedures refer to the preceding paragraph which is standards and procedures specified in the military order referred to in subparagraph A. That military order is an order of August 31st, which talks about procedures. It's not the order that sets up the commission, which is an order issued the preceding November. Rather, this language seems to mean what it says. But even if it didn't, even if it didn't, wouldn't your reading raise a terrifically difficult constitutional question, if not this case, in cases that are pending right now, where prisoners in Guantanamo are claiming that they have not yet had the CSRT hearing. They're claiming one or two. We had it, and we're still here. We won, but we're still here. They're claiming we don't want to be sent back to Qatar, and they're claiming some that they were tortured. All right? Now, if we could avoid the case with your interpretation here, avoid that constitutional question, we can't avoid it. So my question is, one, how is what you're arguing consistent with the language I quoted? And two, how could it, if we accepted your interpretation, possibly avoid the most terribly difficult and important constitutional question of whether Congress can constitutionally deprive this court of jurisdiction in habeas cases? Well, Justice Breyer, let me answer both pieces of that. I certainly think that such standards and procedures to reach the final decision is consistent with the constitutional laws of the United States. There was a reference to the first military order. I believe there's also a reference to any other subsequent orders implementing that. All of that together implements the November 13th order. So I would think that there is, it is very easy to read this language to allow any challenge that is being brought here, with the possible exception of the treaty challenge. And I think the language is capacious enough if the treaty challenge is what you thought was very important, the D.C. Circuit, at the end of the day, could decide whether or not there was a requirement that the treaty challenge be brought. General Clement, if you can um, 
straighten me out on the piece that you read about consistent with the Constitution and laws of the United States. I, I thought that it was the government's position that these uh, enemy combatants do not have any rights under the Constitution and laws of the United States. That is true, Justice Ginsburg, and Congress in this act was very careful to basically write without prejudice to the answer to that question. So we would have that argument. The other side would have their argument. What this act provides that we don't have any argument on that was something that wasn't before this court say in the Rasool decision was the fact that the procedures that the military has promulgated are going to be enforceable under this exclusive review provision. So there, there at least will be some law to apply now under this exclusive review provision. So but, that but, but how will the question whether the laws in the United and Constitution of the United States, whether these petitioners have any claim to state under the laws and Constitution of the United States, because as I read the review that's provided, doesn't open up that question. It's a very narrow review that's given to the D.C. Circuit. Well, Justice Ginsburg, I certainly think the petitioner will be up there arguing that Eisentrager is no longer good law, not just as a statutory matter, as a constitutional matter, and those arguments will be made. Without respect to that, certainly the arguments about Article 21 and Article 36 that are very much the centerpiece of their argument here today would also be available to the D.C. Circuit. And if there's some constitutional requirement that that review be slightly broader or slightly narrower, that seems like something that can better be adjudicated in the context of a concrete case at the point that that review is sought. Is, but one is, thing is I there, think is, is there any review in this court following the D.C. Circuit, either the, the original classification or the conviction? Is there, does this court have any part in this scheme? Yes, Justice Ginsburg, there would be 1254 review. Once the provision is in the Court of Appeals, then the case would be under, under, under E3, the, the review provision, then the case would be in the Court of Appeals for purposes of this Court's 1254 jurisdiction. I still don't see the answer to my question, which had two parts. As to the language, A, which is what's cross-referenced, refers to Military Commission Order No. 1, August 31, 2005, or any successor military order. The order, as I understand it, that's created the commission by the President is an order which was November 13, 2001, not a successor to 2005. But leaving the language aside, what I'm mostly interested in, because I think your interpretation inevitably creates it, is what is the answer to the claim that it is not constitutional for Congress without suspending the writ of habeas corpus to accomplish the same result by removing jurisdiction from the courts in a significant number of cases, even one. Well, Justice Breyer, let me answer that question in two parts, which is to say that I think that this case and most of the cases don't raise a serious suspension clause problem for the simple reason that I think deferring review or channeling it to the Court of Appeals does not amount to a suspension. I listed four sets of cases that I don't see how you could possibly shoehorn into E2 and E3, even if you were able to shoehorn this one, and my language was designed to make you see how difficult it is. Well, I listed four that I don't see how anybody could shoehorn into that. But with respect, Justice Breyer, I think that cuts both ways, because I don't think there's any particular interpretation of these provisions on the table before this Court that's going to eliminate those potential suspension clauses. But clause the whole issues. point, it seems to me, of the argument is, should we not consider the significance of those very questions? Because if we don't, as Justice Breyer said, at the end of the day, as you describe it, we will have to face the, the serious constitutional question whether Congress can, in fact, limit jurisdiction without suspending habeas corpus. The whole point is to grapple with them now and, and, to, and to treat them in a way that allows for this adjudication so that we avoid this constitutional difficulty tomorrow. Well, Justice Souter, first of all, I would think general principles of constitutional avoidance would say deferring the constitutional question is a good thing, not a bad thing. 